Well, folks, we should probably get started. Okay, does everybody know each other? It says, it says take a moment to introduce yourselves to everybody. So let's, let's do that. Yep. I picked on you because your mouth was full. <laughs> How long you been attending now? <laughs> nice. I'm Carol Hoos, and we just joined in November. Oh, and this is my spouse. <laughs> <laughs> William. Well, that's nice. We got a we got a mix of how long people have been here. So I guess I'm pretty new too. I'm her husband. And I've been here since the beginning of June myself. <laughs> well, glad you're all here and welcome. Nice to have a good group always for a class like this. The book that you have in front of you was put together by, by a, um, a Wells pastor in Phoenix. In fact, he's the district president for the Wells' Arizona California district. I like to do a mix of classes. Uh, somebody brought along the wonders of God. I've always enjoyed that. In fact, that particular one I translated into Swedish and used in Sweden when I was a pastor there. Um, I have a couple of different versions of it, in fact. But I've done this one once or twice, and it's I kind of like the fact that it's shorter. We got a lot of material in it, but it's... it's uh, you look at the table of contents, what was it, 15 lessons? Um, I've done some that are 18 and some that are 20. So I thought, we'll see how much we can cram in by doing it in 15 lessons. And the first chapter is simply a review of what makes our church unique in a way and not unique in another way. We are a Christian church, and the Christian church is a church that believes in Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. Um, among Christian churches, there are those who recognize God's word as the verbally inspired word of God and uh, inerrant and infallible, and we would be among that group of churches. So just narrowing it down... <laughs> And as Lutherans, we are those who emphasize what's called justification by faith, which means how we get right with God. We are right with God through faith in Jesus Christ, who is our Savior from sin. And so that, in our Lutheran confessions, is referred to as the doctrine on which the church stands or falls. If you get 
the path to heaven wrong, well, then you kind of lose the point. <laughs> What's it all about? It's all about getting to heaven. How do we get to heaven? By being right with God, which is another uh, a reminder of another word in the Bible, which is righteousness. Um, justification is how we get justified or righteous with God. And uh, I'm just going to review that in this first lesson. How exactly does that happen? Why is it important? Why is it central not only to the church, but why is it central to our lives? Not only our lives as Christians, but why is it central to life on this earth? This is something that is important for every man, woman, and child. So many don't know it. So many need to know it. But it's it's all that matters because our life here on earth is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength, Scripture says. But our life is eternal. And we want to spend our eternity with God. So this is just this little teeny tiny preview, this this earth portion of our life so that we're prepared for the rest of our lives that go on forever and ever. It's the most important thing. It's the reason God put us here on earth to find out how to get to him in heaven. So if you've got your book open to uh, uh, the first page, well, I guess some of my questions up here aren't aren't the same as in the book, but what will help you get the most out of this class? Each, each lesson has a, a little home Bible study section. It's not very long, but if you, if you do the, the assignment, you'll get a lot more out of the class than if you don't. Those of you who came at 9 o'clock and have been here <laughs> that long, this is kind of like college. And Today on Wednesday, you've got a, a full complement of morning college classes. <laughs> so it'll, it'll tax your brain a little bit. But if you were in college, you'd probably also have an assignment or two. And so we'll have little assignments, and that'll obviously make it uh, more productive for you. What can you expect of me? I hope to be able to answer any questions you might have. I hope to be able to teach you in clear terms how to be sure that you're going to heaven, how to understand the Bible, the Bible basics, and how to study the Bible. I trust and hope that <clears throat> this class will help you get even more out of sermons and services on Sunday. Um, List things you would like to learn about God during this class. You have anything specific that you would like to know better before we're done? Yeah, that's a it's a tough big one. it's a big tough one. I I uh, I don't know if I brought it with me, but I I had a like a 70 year old book about that sitting on my desk at my previous church that I think I borrowed from the church library that somebody had donated to it. And uh, so it's not like a new question. It's it's one that a lot of people have asked about. We were just talking about it uh, this just before you got here. In fact. Um, King Hezekiah was sick, and he asked God to let him live another 15 years. You might remember that story. It's where the sun went back up the steps. The sun went backwards as a sign from God that Hezekiah was going to get these 15 more years. And then the question was asked, why did God give him those 15 years when three years later 
he gave birth to Manasseh, the next king of Israel, who was terribly wicked. If God had let him die, <laughs> then you wouldn't have had King Manasseh. But he lived, and he had King Manasseh. And Manasseh messed things up. He re-erected all of the, the uh, idol altars that his father had torn down, and he led Israel astray. Now, of course, Manasseh is the guy who was taken into captivity in Assyria and then repented, so you have that. (laughs) But all we could say in answer was the Isaiah 55 passage we talked about this morning, namely where God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And a a modern example, I think, would be COVID. Why did God let COVID happen? And I can give my conjectures that would be um, in harmony with Scripture, uh, such as I I said from the beginning, this is going to separate the men from the boys in church. Um, Some people have left church and have never come back. And uh, I would say that's true around the country. And uh, it separated the men from the boys, those who were there for the right reasons, perhaps, and those that weren't. One of the other things, before COVID, everybody had this idea that nobody ever dies but old people. And I can control my own future. I just, uh, you know, I buy my Fitbit and I make sure I walk enough and, and so on. And what happened during COVID? Some athletes died of COVID while some old people got COVID and survived just fine, right? And so all of a sudden, for the first time in ages, people had to learn the truth that my times are in your hands, O Lord. Who of you by worrying can add a single day to his life, right? So a lot of good stuff came out of what otherwise is a bad thing. And that's true throughout history. God says in Romans 8.28, I work all things together for your good, for the good of those who love me. And uh, the parallel passage in the Old Testament is in Genesis 50, where Joseph's brothers are afraid that now that daddy's dead, he's going to kill him. And he says, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good, the saving of many lives as you see today. So... But yeah, one of our part of our discussion this morning is will we in heaven ever fully understand these things or will we just not even ask the questions once we get there? And will we, when we get to heaven, will God's ways still be so far above ours that we still won't understand everything? Um, you've heard the expression that's above my pay grade. <laughs> well, there's some stuff that God says is above our pay grade. <laughs> <clears throat> Anything else? False teaching. Being a convert. False teaching. Yeah, why does God allow false teachers? I mean, there's so many that... Uh, well, it's going to be interesting when we get to that on, on what they're talking about. All right, well, let's keep moving since I have an airline flight. Romans 5.12. Why study the Bible? What's the point? There are three questions that we human beings must grapple with in our lives. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? The Bible gives us the answers to these three questions. First, the Bible exposes the problem we all have as human beings. Then it offers the solution we need. What serious problem do we as human beings face? Romans 5.12, I have it on the screen here. Kind of a bad angle here, but sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. So the ultimate problem we all have to face is death, and the Bible tells us how death came into the world. By the way, I said that justification is the doctrine on which the church stands or falls. It's the central teaching of the church. 
but I like to look at it as the hub, like on a wagon wheel. And every other doctrine is a spoke that goes out and holds the whole wheel together. So if you go chopping out the spokes, you're also attacking the doctrine of justification. So one of those spokes is the inspiration of Scripture. You take that away, and then the whole thing falls apart. Or, in this case, you start saying that death came into the world millions of years before the fall into sin. You have just undermined the whole doctrine of justification. The whole point of Scripture is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. Sin entered the world through one man and death by sin. And in this way, death came upon all people. So without death being caused by sin, then, de then sin and death can't be undone by one man, namely the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for our sins. One of the reasons that Christianity has shrunk so much in our country is because of the number one false religion, the religion of secular humanism and its creation story, which is godless evolution. It all fits together in one wheel. You take out any of the spokes and the whole thing falls apart and you wind up on the side of the trail heading out west in your Cuyastoga wagon. So, sin and death, sin and death, all have sinned. What serious problem do we human beings face? Sin and death is the answer. So you can fill those in in your books. <clears throat> Man gets the blame because, because what did he do while she was talking to the devil? He did what so many men do. They stayed home from church. He stood there on the side and gave up his responsibility as the head of the household. So he, he fell down on the job, so he gets the blame. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, he grabbed it right from her and ate some. Yeah, what a dummy. <laughs> all right, 2 Corinthians 5.10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So what appointment awaits each of us? Judgment seat of Christ. An appearance before the court of Jesus. Yes. Yep. And if you want to uh, cover the cost to them, um, you can donate $12. Is that what they are? Fifteen thirty-two. Now that's confusing, though, um, because it says what each one will receive, what was doing, done while he was, what he did, yep. good or bad. So we'll get to that. Because that, that's a two-way thing. Yep. This is only the second question or the okay. first question. So we'll get, we'll get the answers. Okay. So what is the point of religion? It's to prepare for that. It's to prepare for meeting your maker. You've heard the expression, right? Prepare to meet your maker. That's the point of religion. And different religions try to prepare you in different ways to meet your maker. So we want to make sure that we're prepared the right way to meet the actual maker. That's, that's our job. All right, uh, God's courtroom.
The Bible describes our salvation in terms that are very familiar to us, courtroom terms. Throughout the lesson, we'll be looking at different aspects of God's courtroom. To begin with, the previous passage made it clear that Jesus is the judge and we are the defendants. Yeah, that's not on the book. Just look at the slide. Just look at the slide. So in God's courtroom, you're the defendant. Just think about the previous passage. We must all give an account, okay? So we get called before the judge. We're the defendant. Jesus is the judge. So what is the point of religion, membership in a club, handbook on how to live, achieving success or prosperity or happiness in life? A lot of people, I said that COVID separated the men from the boys. The boys are the ones who thought church was membership in a club or who thought that it was a handbook on how to live and it didn't work. So I'm going to leave that behind or it was about being successful. Well, that didn't work. That guy on TV promised me that if I sent him so and so much money, I'd be able to get a motor home. And it didn't work. It sounds like Joel Steen on that number three. <laughs> it's, called the, it's called the prosperity gospel. And it's, it's very, very, very popular. Just look at that basketball stadium that he, that he has there in yeah. Texas, right? Before him, it was it was uh, Jim Baker. I bought the biography. You might find it interesting. Um, so preparation for our court appearance. Are you ready? Now we can go to the top of the next page. If you were to die tonight, and tonight you were to stand before God in judgment. Would God receive you into heaven? You might recognize the next question, too. When God asks you, why should I let you into heaven, what will you respond? These were known as the Kennedy, <coughs> the Kennedy questions. Do you remember, uh, oh, what was his first name? Uh, he was at this big Presbyterian church in Florida. He had a TV program, too. Yeah. Had this fantastic, massive pipe organ that Diane Bish played. Um, even on public TV, they had a special on that. Um, oh. Anyways, these were questions that he popular, popularized for going door to door and sometimes Lutherans would use them too, knocking on doors. If you died tonight, would you go to heaven? Should be able to answer yes, and that's, that's what we want to make sure of, especially in this first lesson. And if he asked you why, Jesus is the answer, right? Jesus sent me. Jesus earned me a place in heaven. Jesus paid for my sins. Jesus was holy in my place. But let's review why those are the right answers. What does God demand from us? Matthew 5.48 says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So God expects holiness and perfection. Well, you can put perfection there and holiness goes with the second passage. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So let's go back to that passage you asked about on the bottom of the previous page. Everyone will give an answer for the deeds done while in the body, whether or good or bad. So according to these two passages, we got a problem, right, Houston? <laughs> God expects us to be holy. Uh, key terms here, holy has, has a double meaning. It can mean set apart, 
like the Latin word for holy is sanctus. So the place where we worship in the building over there is the sanctuary. It's a holy place. That doesn't mean that the carpet doesn't have any snags or stains. Um, but it's been set apart for a special purpose. We tell kids, don't dribble a basketball in there. Hey, quiet down, you're in church, right? It's a holy place. So it's set apart. God expects us to be set apart and sanctified to him. But at its root meaning, holy means perfect. And what about sin? What does the Bible say about sin? Uh, Sin, one Greek word is hamartano. It means missing the mark of perfection. Uh, Another word is iniquity. It means not measuring up. Another word is transgression or trespass. That means crossing the line. So there's those synonyms. What does God demand? How must we love God and our neighbor? On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Now you might remember that, how that goes on. But the young man wanted to justify himself. So he said, who is my neighbor? That's when Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. But the point is, Jesus said, you have answered correctly. If you want to earn your way into heaven, here's what you got to do. You have to love God 100% perfectly all the time, also retroactively from birth. So if you can do that, you can earn your way into heaven. So we must love God and our neighbors with all our hearts as we love ourselves. So now you got our math equation here. Here's what God demands. If we have perfection in the picture, and we have holiness in the picture, and we have sinlessness, no imperfections in the picture, then that equals life, eternal life. So we can earn our way into heaven, theoretically. That was the original plan of salvation, wasn't it? Before that naughty lady and man did what they did. If they had stayed perfect, they, they, they actually started life perfect, unlike us. So they had everything going for them. God gave them a way to worship, namely by not eating of that tree. He, so he gave them freedom of choice. He didn't just lock them in the Garden of Eden. He said, here, there's a way out. I don't want you to take it, but here it is. But you might appreciate what I've given you and instead stay put. So if they had stayed perfect, they would have wound up like the angels who didn't fall into sin, and eventually they just, they would have been unable to sin. It just, you know, you get to a point where you just never do certain things, right? Been there, done that, never worked out, I ain't doing that again, right? But man's memory would be erased, right? Because by the time you got to heaven, everybody would like to choke at him and eat. <laughs> he's our father are you going to choke your dad <laughs> we won't hold it against him I mean when you think about it without without Adam and Eve we'd have no Jesus there'd just be There'd be no, I mean, isn't that the most exciting thing about getting to heaven is seeing the risen Christ? Uh, the, The whole story of salvation is so praiseworthy of itself that 
we wouldn't want to unravel that. So it's all it's all part of history now. Yeah, that's I guess what I'm trying to say in a in a in a way. And I'm really glad that my kids aren't going to strangle me for the bad <laughs> stuff I said, the times I got ticked off. I don't want to get strangled. <laughs> all right. So what does God see in us? I mean, we could banter all day, but I do have a flight, so I'm I'm not going to get too far off track. We, from now on, we can go on all day on the successive Wednesdays. Uh, Romans 3, 10 to 12, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Look at that. No one, not even one. No one, no one. All together no one, not even one. Whoa! <laughs> so I guess we can wipe out the first way of salvation. It's not going to work. What does God see instead of perfection? No one who does good. And then Revelation 21, 8. What is the destiny of all who stand imperfect before God? But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. It's somewhat unpleasant. So hell. How do you like that? Got a one-word answer and a long line. It's fooled you. So, what does God see? No perfection. No holiness. Lots of sin. So what do we get? Eternal death. That's where the starting point is for all of us. So go back to that question at the bottom of the first page. What is the point of religion? We got to fix this. How's it going to get fixed? Well, we can't do anything about it. Look at the bottom of page two. Human religions and philosophies have come up with all kinds of schemes that propose to fix the broken relationship with God and humankind. Perhaps you've heard some of these schemes, or perhaps you've used some of them yourselves. What man-made solutions do people offer to deal with the problems of their sin and pending judgment? Can you think of what some religions teach? Good works. Good works. At least some form of good works is part of every one of them. Now, different religions define them different way. What's the ultimate good work if you're a Muslim? To die. Blow yourself up, take as many with you as possible, then you get 72 virgins who feed you grapes. I don't know how it works for women. What do they get? My question is, when you use one up, what happens to them? They don't, can't tell you either. I've already asked them. They don't know. You know more than I do then. <laughs> uh, what about what about Hindus? What do they what, how do they deal with this? Yeah, and so the hope is that with each life you get better and better and better until finally you enter nirvana. Right? And if you screw up, you might come back as an ant and get stepped on. <laughs> Or a monkey. Yep. Or a snake. 
Well, that's why you can't eat steak, because that's, that was Grandma Jones over there, that cow. <laughs> Yeah, and what do they say? They say, as, as man is, Jesus once was, as God is, man may become. So you eventually become a God by being as good and perfect as possible. Is that in their Book of Mormon? Uh, it's in the Doctrine and Covenants, I oh. believe. Yeah. I that, yes. Yeah, and that's how you get the planet. You're the god for that planet, and the more wives you have, the more souls you can create to populate that planet, and then they'll worship you. So, okay. yeah. <clears throat> so there, there's another solution to the problem. What about what about Buddhism? Buddhism doesn't actually talk in terms of God. They talk in terms of becoming enlightened. You, you would finally attain enlightenment. They asked the Dalai Lama just a few years ago, have you been able to do that? And he honestly admitted no. <laughs> so, but every, every way... To, that people try to get to God amounts to climbing a ladder to get there. You start at the bottom, you climb. You know, the Bible has a stairway to heaven story. In the stairway to heaven story in the Bible, the angels are ascending and descending to Jacob, who's on the ground. It's not about climbing your way up to heaven. Um, the rock and roll song got it wrong. And then other ways that people try to do it is to say, well, I'm, I'm going to try to do more good deeds than bad deeds. So God says, be perfect. In other words, get 100%. And most people are saying, maybe he'll let me get in, get in with a 51%. Or, no, I'll do better than that. I'll climb in with a 60%. I'll do 60% good deeds and only 40% bad deeds. Last I checked, that was still a failing score, right? And if the only score that works is 100%, nothing's going to work. And other people try to say, well, but at least I'm not as bad as my neighbor. Ooh, that'll really persuade God. <laughs> All right, so the evidence against us is sin, imperfection, and lack of holiness. The verdict we deserve is guilty. The sentence we deserve is eternal death in hell. Talk to the judge. Beg, plead, grovel. How might you be able to save yourself from sentencing you rightly deserve? Humans have come up with all kinds of ideas to fix this problem. But how about we look at God's solution? God recognized that we human beings cannot make ourselves right with him. So he earned our salvation for us through Jesus, our substitute. So this passage is talking about Jesus. What was he like? We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So Jesus is being called our high priest. What did the high priest do? That's what the high priest was dressed like in the Old Testament. Hebrews is being written to Hebrews, to Jews. So yes, he would bridge the gap between God here in the Holy of Holies and the people who are outside here. And the priest goes between them. So when Hebrews says we have a high priest who is, a un, who is not unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, 
It's talking about this go-between between people and God. What was he like? A high priest without sin. So if God is going to judge us, and we are going to be judged, who do we want as a go-between in the court scene? Or I should say, what do we want? A lawyer. Exactly. So let's look at this. We've already been through this part. This time we have a defense attorney who is Jesus. What do you think of lawyers? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of different kinds of lawyers. There's people who do business law and things like that. Uh, there was a movie some years ago called Presumed Innocent, I think it was called. Harrison Ford. You remember that? He was accused of murdering his wife. with a hammer in the garage or whatever. And, yeah. and the actor named Raul Julia played his lawyer. And he, he was portraying one of these really expensive, high-powered lawyers that, like, O.J. Simpson might hire. And I remember watching that movie and thinking, man, if I'm ever accused of murder, I want that lawyer. <laughs> it's worth it. <laughs> well, Jesus is the best lawyer ever. That's what we get with him. Galatians 4, 4, and 5 tells us why Jesus was sent into the world. When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. So Jesus was born under law to redeem. Remember what redeem means? Buy back. To buy back or to set free. And he was born under law Jesus is God, he's above the law, but he was born under the law, which means he was subject to the law, which means he had to keep the law perfectly as our substitute. He had to do that in our place. So that's why he was sent to live an entire life before he died for our sin. So why did God send Jesus into the world to redeem us or set us free? by living under the law in our place. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the actual verdict, because of our defense attorney, is he pleads guilty in our place. And the actual sentence for Jesus is death. So God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. In other words, he put our sin on Jesus, who took it to the cross so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, took Jesus' perfection and put it on us. 
So if you want to draw that in. His perfection is counted as ours. Our sin was counted as his. Did you want a book? Leslie actually made an extra copy. I have a copy of the first one. Um, first lesson. I want to keep that book for Tammy. Yeah. Mark 115, what does Jesus invite us to do? The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. First Timothy 1.15 Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. How did Paul consider himself? The worst of sinners but saved by Christ. Acts 16, 30 and 31. Paul and the apostles were in jail, you might remember, in Philippi, and there was an earthquake, and the doors of the prison all opened up, and the chains fell off all the prisoners, and the Roman jailer, the centurion in charge, thought, all right, the penalty for falling down on the job is execution, the honorable thing like with the Japanese, is to commit Harry Carey. So he's about to kill himself. He's trembling. Paul says, don't, don't do it. We're all still here. And he falls down trembling before Paul and says, what must I do to be saved? He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe in Jesus and you will be saved. <clears throat> and then, of course, he took the apostles home and they washed their wounds and fed them. And it says that Paul explained the gospel to everybody in the household and they were all baptized. John 3.16, what change takes place in believers? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now we don't die but live. So in a believer, God sees the perfection of Jesus plus sins that have been washed away. And that equals eternal life. Do you think God could have made it a lot easier if he had just destroyed the devil from the beginning? We were heavy. I'm just putting out his plan, right? I think probably all of us would have come up with a different plan. Yes. But then none of us is qualified to write The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe yep. or to write The Lord of the Rings. You know, those two guys, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, 
they base their stories on the fantastic story of salvation. And as a result, they became very, very great authors. And nobody's ever seen anything I've written because I'm not that good. And I, I often think about that. Uh, think of the title of one of the movies about the life of Jesus. It's called The Greatest Story Ever Told. And so, yeah, you're right. None of us are great authors. None of us are qualified to be God. So we didn't come up with a great story, and we think, yeah, I would have done a comic book instead. But instead, God wrote his story. And, when you, and the more you study it, the more incredibly fantastic it is. Um, there's a devotion that Sarah's going to read at the beginning of a choir practice, or at least, right, on Thursday night? Well, I think it's all right. Well, anyways, the introduction to this new book of devotions for musicians that came out with the new hymnal. Um, fantastic wording. You want to grab it off of the credenza in there? Here? No, in my office. Okay. There's, and just read those lines when, when you get back. <clears throat> I think that kind of answers the question in a way. But let's look at this, our, this legal diagram one, one more time. So the defendant is you, the judge is Jesus, the law equals perfection, holy life, no sin. The evidence against us is imperfection and sin and lack of holiness. The verdict we deserve is guilty. The sentence we deserve is eternal death in hell. Our defense attorney is Jesus. The actual verdict that's handed down is guilty, but it's pronounced on Jesus because he's pleaded guilty in our place. And the actual sentence, because he's guilty, is death, and so he actually died in our place. And so now, the, the verdict for us is not guilty. And the actual sentence for us is eternal life. One of the definitions of the word justification is to declare not guilty. When God justifies us, he declares that we are just. He declares that we are right. He declares that we are not guilty. He declares that we are righteous. In school that I learned, back in high school, the pastor said that the word justify would mean just as if I. Yes. I like that, just as if I were holy. Yeah. I was trying to think of that. Thank you. I was try, trying, to, trying to pull that out back here, and you got it. I like that. Did you find that line? I wonder if it was this one. He's talking about entering the sanctuary, the world that's ours during the worship service, so we get to glimpse part of God's glory. And here is his word he says uh, um, in this world within the world the atmosphere is thick with a haunting and exotic language there are costly items to look at a well-worn book a basin of water some bread some wine defining things to hold up in the light and ask so what does this do oh my goodness how much time do you have that water shimmers with promise. That meal is to die for once you acquire the taste. Yeah, that's it. And the same thing is true of the story. That story is to die for once you get it. Holy, holy, holy. Wow, what a story God wrote. God himself became a human in order to save humanity it's crazy, crazy genius. It's just crazy. And that's what he did. God became our brother. That's just outrageous. Who could come up with a story like that but God? 
So I'm I'm satisfied with the gospel. I think I think uh, if I were British, I'd say it's jolly good. <laughs> So justify is a legal term to declare someone not guilty. Being declared not guilty is different than being not guilty. There it is. We are justified. It's just as if I'd never sinned. How do you like that? I don't have it in my brain, but it's in my computer. (laughs) All right, blessings from trusting Christ, Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In Galatians 5, 22 to 23, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So God's Spirit produces in us fruits of faith, good character, and behavior. And so back to our Original questions. Are you certain that if you died tonight, you would go to heaven? And what about... Your response to God's question, why should I let you into heaven? Well, I try as hard as I can to produce the fruits of the Spirit, to be kind and helpful to others. I go to church every Sunday. I read my Bible every day. None of these are anything but good things, right? I'm a pastor. I believe in Jesus with all my heart. I really, really, really believe and trust. I have lots and lots of faith. My faith is in Jesus is very strong. (laughs) Jesus died for my sins. Oh, there we go. There's a good answer. (laughs) You can't punish me for my sins. You already punished Jesus, my perfect substitute for them. You have declared me not guilty through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Those are good answers. Have you seen that uh, that uh, picture that's going around of of uh, from the Carol Burnett show with uh, who was Carol Burnett's sidekick, um, Vicki Lawrence? And then she plays the mother with the blue hair. And it's that Ken Berry sitting at the table. And, and he says, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. And, and Mama answers, you don't need a parachute to jump out of a plane either. <laughs> but it sure helps. <laughs> Right? (laughs) Well, you've got the study at home uh, section there. If you look on the next page, it asks you to to go through Romans 3, 19 to 26 and fill those out. There's the true-false questions. Do those and we'll go through them together then. And then there's discussion questions on page 6. So that's the homework. And if you're willing to do it, you've got some daily Bible readings here in the box, Romans 1 through 6.
And if you really want to get into it, you got two memory passages. You might know them already. <coughs> Any questions? Wow, we did it in just over an hour. I'm pleased. Let's close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your word. Continue to work through your word by sending your Holy Spirit into our hearts. Strengthen our faith. Strengthen our zeal to know you better. In Jesus' name, amen.